Well, the FLDS faithful believed it was their God who helped Warren Jeffs, that notorious leader of the fundamentalist church, elude captures by federal authorities. But I'm convinced it was because of his bodyguard who planned his escape long before federal marshals descended on that church meeting house. Let's explore how he did it. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Profiling Evil, in Episode 9 of our exploration of the fundamentalist polygamous church on that Utah-Arizona border, Hilldale and Colorado City. Please make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button, and please ring that bell so that you get all of our video notifications when they get released. Now, Through an analysis of the cult's ideology, the legal battles, and law enforcement's efforts, I'm going to shed some light on the complexities of religious extremism and the challenges posed by these charismatic leaders who exploit their followers. Yeah, I find myself choking a little on my own words when I say charismatic, because I don't know about you, but I don't think Warren Jeffs was charismatic at all. To me, if I, you can tell. Anybody who wants to read this message, or see the video, that they can see it. Even apostates and Gentiles. that they may know that I have been a liar. And the truth is not in me. I am not the prophet. I never was the prophet. You are the prophet. Just a minute. The Lord's still dictating. This is not a test. This is a revelation. from the Lord God of heaven. Through his former servant, who was never his servant, who is dictating these words at this time. That you may know this is not a test. I say farewell again to all who qualify for Zion. Farewell. In fact, his sing-song voice always kind of creeped me out. But 
His followers believed him. Now to lay some groundwork, let's refresh ourselves on Warren Jeff's rise to the top of power inside the FLDS church. His reign continues to be a very dark chapter in the history of this religiously extreme group, especially among the FLDS faithful. Now, because the FLDS faithful believe and revere the men who serve as their leaders as prophets, I say self-proclaimed prophets, um, this new prophet had a fervent following and he maintained an iron grip on all of his followers' lives. That's why people followed Warren Jeffs. It wasn't because of that sickeningly sing-song voice of his. This self-proclaimed prophet wielded power and authority with ruthless determination. However, his reign of control and his manipulation was not without opposition. In fact, as legal pressures mounted and law enforcement closed in, Jeffs found himself facing imminent arrest. Well, prior to his arrest in Texas, this predator had also been accused of sexual abuse and statutory rape in Utah, and he faced charges of rape as an accomplice back to 2006 and earlier, where he was charged with arranging the marriage of a 14-year-old girl to a 19-year-old cousin. Well, later, Jeffs would face additional charges in Arizona and Texas after officials stormed the Yearning for Zion Ranch in 2008. But regardless of the mounting legal pressures and the allegations that he was a child sex abuser, Jeffs maintained his grip on the fundamental church members. And none of those fundamental members were more committed, more loyal than was his bodyguard, Willie Jessup. Now, you've heard me talk about my relationship with Jessup over the years. He was, Jessup was a formidable opponent. We didn't like each other, and as escape, escape would prove, this guy was really good at his job of keeping Warren Jeffs out of the reach of pursuing criminal investigators. Warren Jeffs didn't really earn the title of prophet. He kind of inherited it after his father, Rulin Jeff, served as the leader for many decades. And as he was nearing death, Warren Jeffs convinced his followers that his father had actually declared the words that Warren should be the next prophet. Well, they bought it. And under Warren Jeff's leadership, the FLDS intensified its isolationist practices and they doubled down on the adherence they had to these strict fundamental principles, including polygamy and child marriage. Now, his authoritarian rule extended way beyond religious doctrine. It permeated every aspect of his followers' life, from familial relationships, the very intimate relationships, to even economic endeavors that they were invited in. Well, if you're wondering what made Willie Jessup such a formidable foe for me, this former bodyguard to the FLDS prophets once told me that he was trained by the famous Blackwater Company. Now, you'll remember Blackwater from the news media during the uh, Iraq War. Blackwater is globally known as a paramilitary elite training center. It was founded by a former U.S. Navy SEAL, and Blackwater, which now operates under a different name, spent its time training members of the military from all around the world. Their customers also included military and law enforcement officers from the United States federal government, agencies like the U.S. Marshals Service, the CIA, and the other three-letter organizations in the federal government. Using the training that he received at Blackwater, and this is according to Jessup, because I've never confirmed it with Blackwater officials, Jessup orchestrated Warren Jeff's escape using those same tactics that the officers who were trying to capture him were using. So he was using the same tools trained by the same people that the officers that were trying to affect the arrest were trained by. Jessup told me that he and his team of security officers 
Uh, they were fittingly called the God Squad, trained. trained at Blackwater in surveillance techniques. And I was witness to those surveillance techniques, to sniper and anti-sniper training, and, of course, executive protection strategies. Their responsibility included spying on the members of the community and ensuring the safety of their prophet, Warren Jeffs. You know, any time the FLDS people would come together for large church meetings back then, uh, Willie Jessup would intensify the efforts of the God Squad. And, and like all other times when the group of polygamists came together, on January 14, 2006, 5,000 plus members of the FLDS faithful converged on the large meeting hall where they were going to receive instruction from Warren Jeffs and the other leaders of the FLDS. Jessup was aware that federal officials had warrants for Jeffs and his brother Lyle and about 30 other leaders of the cult. To thwart law enforcement efforts, Jessup and his team worked feverishly with the town marshal, and by the way, he was reporting to the FLDS back then too, to throw off any legitimate law enforcement effort as they tried to find these wanted men. So for weeks before this meeting happened, Jessup and the God Squad successfully created diversion after diversion. This caused law enforcement to follow all kinds of false leads as they attempted to arrest Warren Jeffs. Jessup and his team would go as far as boarding planes and using credit cards to throw investigators off. And while the God Squad threw out diversion after diversion, Warren Jeffs was flitting around on private jets or traveling from place to place in different vehicles. He was spending the FLDS faithful funds attempting to evade police. Well, on that day, Jessup knew that law enforcement would be looking at that large meeting house as a location where they could possibly capture Jeffs, knowing that he would slip in there periodically to preach to his followers. The building was built many years earlier and is known as the Leroy S. Johnson Meeting House. And in preparation for a needed escape, Jessup devised a plan that from the church they could strategically get any person they needed to out of the church and out of law enforcement's hands. In fact, they strategically placed two brand new ATVs in the basement furnace room, right near a concrete ramp that led to some exterior doors. His plan was to always have those ATVs in the ready position whenever Warren Jeffs was preaching. The plan went on further, that if, in fact, law enforcement came in, they would burst from the church on the ATV, race over to the river bottoms, and then go into the bottom of the river, and they take the ATV through the river bottoms, where they knew where the deep parts were and the shallow parts, and they would head west until they hit Central Street and an awaiting vehicle that they would run off with this uh, predator in a uh, tow with well hey folks i want to pause just long enough to invite you to go over and purchase my book deceived an investigative memoir of the zion society cult since we're talking about cults i thought this would be appropriate to bring up and for those of you who have already purchased the book thank you so much for for the rest of you deceived it chronicles my investigation into another polygamous cult that was sexually abusing children. In fact, there were more than 4,000 assaults against those children, and we took 70 police officers in and raided the compound, rescuing those kids from the abuse that they were enduring. The book chronicles the case from a very appropriate and tasteful approach. We don't delve into the ugliness of what happened, but we do acknowledge the fact that the abuse occurred. It talks about the investigation, the ideology of the cult, and what cult leaders do to maintain control over the people that are joining their cults. I think you'd enjoy how we put together a way for you to understand more fully 
The Characteristics of Cult Behavior. You can find the book at profilingevil.com. And for the next month, I'm going to be signing the book free of charge. So don't buy an autographed version. I'll sign it anyway. And thanks for your support of Profiling Evil. Now let's get back to this discussion on the FLDS polygamous community in Short Creek. Well, with their plan in place, the God Squad trained, knowing that one day law enforcement would descend on the church. And it happened on a January morning in 2006. The church was filled to capacity with some 5,000 plus faithful from the FLDS polygamous community. Law enforcement had 66 subpoenas in hand. And as this large contingent of officers entered the building searching for Jeffs and those other leaders, the plan that Willie Jessup had put in place sprung into action. You see, seconds before they reached the doors, Jessup's God Squad alerted him of the officers approaching. You know, in, in reality, there was rarely any surprise in the community since the God Squad knew every vehicle that came into the community and usually followed them. Well, many years later, Willie Jessup told me how he had that meeting house staged for a quick escape. And I'm going to share some video as we talk through that in a second here. But while the members of the polygamous God Squad were attempting to intercede and slow down those encroaching officers, other members of the God Squad, the more elite members, were sounding the alarm across the community. Well, many years later, Jessup would tell me how he had the meeting house staged for his quick escape. Some of it might be a little repetitive, but I'm going to go through it anyway. You see, while members of the polygamous God Squad were slowing down those officers that were approaching the church trying to serve those warrants, other church security officers from the God Squad were sounding the alarm across the community. That alarm went to teams that were stationed all throughout the community in trucks that had trailers on the back of them. And those trailers had drop doors. And inside those trailers were vehicles and motorcycles and other pieces of equipment. So these God Squad members began driving these decoy vehicles, vehicles that resembled the vehicle Jeffs rode in normally, past all of these agents that were attacking the church. As the agents tried to triage this overwhelming amount of decoy, Willie Jessups loaded Jeffs into a different vehicle and started toward the Colorado City Airport where he had a plane that was waiting. And just as the God Squad activated these countermeasures, Jessup's security officers started confronting the raiding police officers at the door, reportedly slow walking them, as Jessup would say, into the building, feigning that they were going to take them right to Warren Jeffs. What they didn't realize is while their attention was there, Jessup was removing Jeffs through that unattended door and up the ramp. He sent one rider out of the uh, on an ATV to draw police officers away from Jeffs initially. Then he and Jeffs jumped onto another ATV and drove over and into the river, riverbed just like they'd planned. Once they hit the river riverbed, they made their way through the bo river bottoms avoiding the deep parts in the river and getting down to Central Street where they jumped into an awaiting vehicle and started toward the airport. But Willie Jessup told me that he had received intel in that short trip that the feds were already at the airport. So instead, they detoured to a trailer that was staged nearby that had two motorcycles in it, some cash, prepaid credit cards, wigs, business cards and all kinds of other things and they jumped on those bikes and fled the area and su successfully escaped law enforcement efforts. Sam Sitting Weissen of Growing Up in Polygamy and I took time to talk outside the Leroy Johnson meeting house. Sam was actually in the building on the day of the police raid and he witnessed everything that happened there so I want to take time to stop and listen 
to our exchange together. And I hope, folks, that you'll go over to Growing Up in Polygamy, Sam and Melissa's channel, and sign up. I think they do a great job, and I have just enjoyed thoroughly the chance to meet with Sam and Melissa on a regular basis to talk about these cases that we're revealing to you now. But let's go to that conversation with Sam. Hey, welcome back everyone. Sam here with Growing Up in Polygamy. And Mike with Profiling Evil, and we have been having a blast as we go around and reminisce. Me from a cop's perspective, <laughs> yeah. as a former investigator trying to infiltrate the FLDS, and you as a member of the FLDS. Yes, yeah, just the memories flooding back as a little boy and a teenager living here and growing up in this beautiful place. As we stepped out of the truck here, I just said, man, I, don't, I think I took for granted how beautiful it is. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful area. And it's nice to see the community being rebuilt now. And some of these old, run-down, rugged homes are starting to turn into beautiful homes now. So it's just a nice area to visit again. Yeah, it really is beautiful here, actually. We, even with the rain drizzling down. You know, um, behind us is the FLDS Church. Yes. The chapel, uh, the, the main hub the uh, the neuro center of everything <laughs> Warren Jeffs and uh, it just causes me before we talk about it to just come up with one question Sam that always has troubled me is that the FLDS claimed to be such a church going people but they really didn't go to church well interestingly back in the day before Warren Jeffs took over we did go to church quite a bit so we would have a church meeting at 2 p.m. on Sunday. You probably wish you would have known that back then, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I would have been there. I'd have gone to church. At 2 p.m. on Sundays, we would meet here for about two hours. Now, before that on Sunday, we would hold what we called Sunday school, but that was held in our own homes. And in our own homes is where we would partake of the sacrament. So we did it a little bit differently than the mainstream LDS church does. And of course, it was very different out here in the mainstream LDS church. But we did have like the, the sacrament with the bread and the water and things like that. And then we would come to chapel here and we would fill this place to the brim. I mean, this was packed full of cars in, in, in the parking lot here and in other parking lots across the street. Just filled this building full of people. We would come here and listen to the leaders taught for about two hours. And because my father was not only the mayor of the city, he was a patriarch of the church. So he had a very high calling within the priesthood in the church. And because of that, he actually gave talks quite frequently here as well. That had to have been something. And if I remember right, the uh, building itself would hold at a maximum maybe about 5,000 people. Or is that, uh, am I off on that? I think you're about right in there, yes. Yeah. I, I, for some reason, I... 2,000 was in my head, but I, I think it can hold more than 2,000. Now, now I hope I haven't, haven't uh, uh, fouled that up, but that's that's the number I remember. So I want to talk about the day that the Warren Jeffs escaped federal marshal custody, because yes. right. that was kind of a remarkable day, and I, and I want to know if you were there when that happened. But, but uh, to lay the groundwork, folks, what happened is in the church behind us, there was a large gathering. Warren Jeffs was speaking and federal marshals came in and closed in on the area surrounding the building and moving in. Willie Jessup relayed to me that his uh, security officers alerted him inside that the raid was impending and he put into action a plan that he had devised long before, uh -huh. which was to take Warren out of this door just near the dumpster and load him into an awaiting vehicle and head straight this direction, right over the top of us, uh -huh. and through a barricade of federal agents who were blocking this gate off. And then, as we can see on the drone here, what we've done is he headed straight across this dirt parking lot and into the river bottoms where he turned and headed west out of town yep. and escaped federal, process, yeah. or federal arrest. So they had it very well planned out. It was no, what should we do? There was a plan put in place if people are coming after the leaders of the church, we have an escape route. And that is what they did, and they got away. And I was there in that, in that meeting, actually. It was a Saturday meeting. It wasn't a Sunday meeting. It was a Saturday morning meeting, which we started doing a lot of those as well, every Saturday. And that was more just so that people, Warren Jeffs could teach the people, and then we would talk about work projects that needed to be done around the community, and then we would go from there and do different types of work. 
So, but during that time, yes, I was facing this way right here, sitting on a chair, just a little bit down from the, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is there were two different places where the leaders would speak and sit. On this end over here is where the main meeting was, and that was most of the time during Sunday meetings is where they would be sitting up here on the stand. And then there was a choir behind them in this building. On Sunday meetings, for whatever reason, we all faced this way, and the stand was down here, and there was another place for leaders to sit and preach, and there was a stage behind them there where sometimes they would put on performances or skits or that kind of thing. I so, have no idea. Right. And so, what, you never found out the reasoning between the switch? Was it something to, to a, a more uh, holier presentation because Warren was going to be speaking, or what, what was it? I, I honestly don't really know why they switched. It seemed like they switched because of, you know, one was for Sunday and the other was for Saturday, more of like a work meeting. But a lot of preaching and, and stuff would go on there too. So what was the mood inside when all of a sudden all these federal agents crashed through the doors? Well, uh, it was during the prayer, as I recall, and we all had our head bowed and the person was up there saying the closing prayer or I believe, I don't remember if it was the opening or closing. I thought it was the closing prayer of the meeting. And all of a sudden we heard all of this commotion at the door and we could tell something was happening, but we weren't sure what. And by the time I looked up, all of the leaders or the main leaders of the church were gone. And they had disappeared in the middle of the prayer. And of course, now we know they escaped federal, uh, federal authorities. And so it was very, it was a scary time for me. I, we didn't know what was going on, but we did know that there were men, bodyguards of Warren Jeffs and leaders that were holding off the officials, the law authorities, and wouldn't let them come in the door. And that's what all the commotion was. You know, so that really begs the question that when they escaped, what did that do to your belief that this truly was a prophet of God? Uh, it built it uh, <laughs> uh, 10 times, you know, it was a, a very big faith promoting experience for all of us, I would say. And really that's when Warren Jeffs was finally caught and put in prison. That was so hard for me to wrap my brain around how it could possibly happen because I thought every time that the, the authorities were after him, he was going to escape because God was on his side. Well, that escape, along with Texas and Arizona charges, landed Warren Jeffs on the FBI's most wanted list. Willie Jessup, the bodyguard, had protected his prophet, and the police departments walked away empty-handed. Now, this is a rabbit hole you can go down, and if you ever want to really learn more about that, just go over and look up how Warren Jeffs was finally arrested outside of the city of Las Vegas, the, the city of sin. It's kind of fitting, isn't it? Well, after Warren Jeffs was arrested, Jessup continued to protect Warren Jeffs until he discovered the secret tapes of Warren Jeffs sexually assaulting child brides. That was just too much for the man who later would turn state's evidence against Jeffs. Now, at first, Jessup thought that these compromising photos and audio recordings of Jeff's involving this 12-year-old bride were all fabricated. He was angry with what he thought was the government's shameless act of falsifying evidence. In fact, he was so angry that he decided he was going to prove them wrong, and he started interviewing the alleged victims in the case. Now, he could have gotten in a little trouble for witness tampering, in my opinion, but he did it anyway. And as he listened to Warren Jeff's victims explain how this self-proclaimed prophet predator had assaulted him, he became so sickened that he actually had to go out and throw up. Jessup's found himself at a crossroads. He could now continue to, uh, to protect Warren Jeff's and the FLDS church which would allow him to maintain his position of power and control, or he could help the government clean the slate. Well, he decided he needed to confront Warren Jeff's brothers with the evidence that he had, hoping that they would realize that the FLDS ideology had gone completely off the rails. But he was surprised to find out that they wanted him 
to remain quiet, but he wouldn't do so. So Willie Jessup started then speaking out, and as soon as he did, his own life started to be threatened. Now, some say that Willie Jessup only turned against Warren Jeffs because he thought that he was going to get pulled into this criminal case somehow and be charged. And I think that's probably true. Others say that he was truly surprised to learn the allegations of sexual abuse were actually true and he was trying to right the ship. I'm going to let you decide why he did it, but one thing is clear. Willie Jessup's testimony ended up playing a critical role in convicting Warren Jeffs and sending him to prison for the rest of his life. Well, as Jessup spoke out, he was cut off from the FLDS church. He lost all of his control, and the FLDS leaders went after all of his assets. And remember, through that UEP, everyone donated everything to the church. This group of leaders orchestrated breaking into Jessup's excavating business where they took his phones and his records and they ripped the hard drives out of their computers. Willie Jessup tried to stop the thieves, but the whole time the town marshal circled the area and refused to help Jessup. Remember, back then the town marshal reported to the prophet of the FLDS church. A Justice Department attorney would later ask Willie Jessup why he didn't do anything at that time. And Jessup responded, because they'd have killed me. They would have killed me on the spot. Well, when Jessup testified against Warren Jeffs in his trial, the prosecutor even went deeper and he said, why are you cooperating with this investigation? You'd served so long as a bodyguard to Warren Jeffs, to his father, and even to Johnson. And Jessup reportedly replied, because those guys were raping little girls. Now, he used other words, which I'm not going to use. Well, Warren Jeffs was convicted, and he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison now, although he continues to run the affairs of the FLDS Church from prison. The well-known polygamous sect is back in the news. Authorities in Texas are fighting to seize a compound in Texas belonging to the group led by Warren Jeffs. You may remember Jeffs was suspected of taking dozens of underaged brides, but he was convicted last year of sexually assaulting two young women. And another of the towns where Jeffs' followers live is in the spotlight as well. And this one is on the border between Utah and Arizona. ABC News spent a year investigating the education of children there and the control Jeffs still exerts from his prison cell. Amy Robach made the trip to a secret world. Deep in the desert on the border between Utah and Arizona, a polygamous sect of 8,000 people are still living a secret life, obeying the commands of their leader, Warren Jeffs. He was sentenced to life in prison for the sexual assault of girls as young as 14. We miss our prophet. We know he's innocent. A year-long investigation by 2020 reveals that Jeffs, from behind prison bars, still controls every aspect of his followers' lives. Obey the prophet when he speaks, and you'll be blessed. Disobey him, it is death. In this community where a man needs three wives to gain salvation, Warren Jeffs married over 80 women. Every week, he issues bizarre orders that seem random to outsiders. Now it is down that you cannot eat corn. No sex between husband and wife. At home, then you couldn't have any toys. You couldn't ride bikes either. This community has often taken young boys out of school to work in construction. Willie Steed told us he helped build this multi-million dollar house for Jeffs, even though his sentence was life. They said if we build it, then it would melt the bars or whatever in his jail and he would be released. Is Warren Jeffs in charge? We asked people all over town about Warren Jeffs, but no one would answer our questions. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hello. But the most destructive form of control is Jeffs' banishment of hundreds of people from the town. This midwife has birthed hundreds of babies. She's worked here for almost 40 years. On a busy day, I can see as many as 20 to 25 patients. But just a few months ago, she too was banished. Willie Steed's family was torn apart too. And, and what happens to your loved ones is hell. 
A kind of underground railroad for those escaping from polygamy is now helping Willie's family slowly adjust to modern life. Like many young boys here, he could barely read. Nodge. Close. As for his sisters, a milestone. They were never allowed to cut their hair before. That was quite a time for us. We get emotional, though, when you talk about it. We have to move on in life when we leave things behind. One family now beyond Jeff's reach, thousands more still isolated in the desert, obeying his word. And Amy Roback is here now. Amy, no one can do anything about this. this what about the Board of Education and the schools? And, and we spoke with them, and they say the FLDS is protected by a homeschooling law that is separate in Utah. Basically, school officials, the Board of Education, have no rights to go in and make any assessment of what's going on inside these homes. They cannot tell the, the parents what type of curriculum to use or to not use. They say their hands are tied. And what about the prison system and Jeff's sending out messages? We can't contacted the Texas Department of Criminal Justice who told us that most offenders, like Warren Jeffs, have basic rights. They have rights to send and receive mail. They have rights to use the telephone. They have rights to have visitors on pre-approved guest lists, and those rights apply to Warren and Jeffs. tell me again the name of the group that is helping some of them get this out. This is Holding Out Help, and they are, are so desperate for money and for help because they provide so much for these families who have nothing when they leave, not even a driver's license sometimes. All right, Amy Robach, as we said, going into a very secret world. You know, a few years ago, he prophesied that the walls of the prison would tumble to the earth. That is, if the FLDS members were faithful enough. Well, I guess they weren't because the prison walls didn't tumble. It might have happened in the Battle of Jericho in the Bible but it hasn't happened in Texas or in the FLDS community of Short Creek. In fact, a lot of Warren Jeff's prophecies have not been coming true, and the community of Hildell and Colorado City is changing almost daily. Today, that big church building, the Leroy S. Johnson Meeting House, is being converted into a community center. Now think about this. This is a 10,000 square foot building it has a stage on one end and a pulpit and stadium seating on the other end. There's a big baptismal font in there. It's a place that only members of the FLDS church, the faithful members, were allowed to go back in Warren Jeff's days. But once they got excommunicated from the FLDS, they were never allowed to go back in until now. Because this building is now owned by the United Effort Plan and is being renovated and changed. You know, there's this baptismal font that I mentioned a second ago. And just like the home that Warren Jeffs built for his 87 wives, the church building also had secret rooms in it that were behind big cabinet areas. There's a ladder that goes up into the attic where you can see all of the wiring for the intricate camera system that was inside and there's an area that once served as an office for warren jeffs with copy machines paper and all that kind of stuff still in there but it's all being renovated in fact that little room is a place where warren jeffs used to publish his writings and send them to politicians all across the country the God Squad used one of those rooms as their control room, a place where they monitored all the cameras that they had positioned throughout Colorado City, Arizona, and Hildell, Utah. But by 2018, the FLDS Church quit using the facility because the United Effort Plan now owned it, and nobody would put forth any effort to obtain the building because it was tainted by evil means. The UEP Trust is now converting the church into a community center, complete with a performance area that takes advantage of that nice little stage inside there. Now, the other side of the building is going to be converted into a basketball court, and the area where the pulpit and the stadium seating was once located, uh, it's going to be covered with a curtain but used for community events. It, it has really turned into an exciting venue and I'm sure a slap in the face to the FLDS faithful. But and just across from the church was the historic 
Radio Tower in Colorado City. And before we go over there, I want to remind you to join choir practice on the first Monday of every month. Now, if you don't know what choir practice is on Profiling Evil, you're going to want to tune in, just like Dr. Phil does. Hey, everybody. Look who I'm hanging out with. And uh, listen, I'm not attending choir practice, but I just wanted to tell you that you need to be watching Profiling Evil YouTube. Don't miss it. I'm telling you, there's something there for you every single time. I never miss. You shouldn't either. Well, let's get back to our tour of Short Creek. You know, just east of the church is the historic radio tower. This was another great vantage point for the God Squad, where they would watch over all the things happening in the valley below. I wanted to just take a moment and share a little drone imagery from up there to highlight how small this community is and, frankly, how large the area is. You see, standing tall amidst the rugged landscape, this tower bore witness to a bygone era of communication and technological advancement. It was constructed in the early 20th century, and it served as a vital link for the communications that were going on in the region. It was built at a time when radio was revolutionizing how information was disseminated across the community, and the tower played a crucial role in connecting the members of the community. Now, believe it or not, it was actually a technical marvel of its time, it has a kind of a lattice structure composed of steel beams, supported antennas, and all of that together transmitted radio signals across these huge distances that you've seen earlier in video. This was all long before internet and widespread telephone usage. And, you know, I, I wonder and I find myself wondering, but who would get to use it in Colorado City or Hilldale, Short Creek, as we've talked about? Because the members of the FLDS had no access to outside communication. Anything from the outside was strictly monitored by the FLDS leadership. I find myself wondering how much it really was used for those kinds of purposes versus paid for with government funds to put it in, but used by the God Squad for surveillance, maybe even some police communication. But this radio tower still holds some deep cultural significance for the Short Creek area. And as time marches on and technology evolves, the tower is going to become less and less significant and probably be torn down at some point. Cellular towers today make broadband communication possible. The, the historic and cultural importance of this tower, though, in my opinion remains. The, the tower is kind of a beacon of remembrance. And as you look beyond the small structure at the desert backdrop, think about what Colorado City Hilldale was like then and what it was like during the stronghold of the FLDS church or today. You know, despite Warren Jeff's eventual capture is predatory legacy continues to haunt the people who lived in that area. His story, in my opinion, serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked power and the importance of vigilance in protecting vulnerable populations from coercive manipulation and abuse. I'd really like to know your thoughts, and I hope that you'll share them in the comment section down below. You know, you can find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And I hope you'll check us out on those platforms and make sure you subscribe by clicking on the links like the one below. Now, you might also enjoy Profiling Evil podcasts, which are in an audio format found on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to check out ProfilingEvil.com. It is a great place to stay up to date on all things Profiling Evil. And while you're there, make sure you're signing up for our digital newsletter, the BOLO. BOLO stands for Be On The Lookout. And it's only going to be delivered to those of you who have signed up. And don't worry, folks, I'm not going to share your email with anyone. And you could cancel at any time. 
We have a brand new bolo coming out in another week, so please make sure you're subscribed. And thanks again. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene.